So good evening, everyone. My name is Danielle Apfelbaum, and I'm the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the Thomas D. Greenlee Library. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the fourth virtual STEM poetry reading series at Farmingdale State College. Funded by a 2022 Students First grant, this virtual series has two primary goals. First, to expose the FSC community to the work of poets writing about and or working within STEM. And second, to enhance the FSC's community's engagement with STEM majors through conversation with authors about the synergistic relationship between STEM and poetry. Currently, camera and microphone access is disabled for attendees. If you wish to make comments or ask questions throughout the reading, please utilize the chat feature. Uh, we will have time to get to those questions at the very end of the reading. Uh, if you would like a reminder, I will pop in the chat a form that you can fill out so that you can be reminded when the recordings are ready and also when the next reading is coming up. I'll do that in just a moment. And finally, if you've been to a re poetry reading in the past, you notice that ours has a bit of a twist. Each of our poets will read uh, for approximately 20 minutes, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion about the synergy between poetry and STEM work and vice versa. Uh, we'll also end with a little challenge for the audience. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first poet, Betsy Aoki. Betsy is a poet, short story writer, and game producer. Her first poetry collection, Breakpoint, was a National Poetry Series finalist and received the Patricia Bibby First Book Award. Its signature poem, Slouching Like a Velvet Rope, was selected by Pulitzer Prize winner Jericho Brown as the winner of the Auburn Witness Poetry Prize. Aoki has received grants and fellowships from the City of Seattle, Artist Trust Foundation, Jack Straw Writers Program, Clarion West Writers Workshop, and Hedgebrook. She currently serves as an assistant poetry editor at Terrain.org and on the board of Clarion West Writers Workshop. To find out more about her writing, go to BetsyAoki.com. Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, take it away. Hey everyone, um, thanks for putting up with my technical difficulties in the setup of the reading. Um, and I'd like to thank Farmingdale State College for hosting this, um, for my co-reader, Rebecca Durham, and uh, folks who will see this as a recording. We're still thinking of you too. Um, we're looking forward to um, hearing from you later. Um, I have a, a few poems that I'd like to read. Um, my First book, Breakpoint, is about women in technology, and it's actually dedicated to uh, the women that are actually making things happen. Um, sometimes the, the contributions are recorded and sometimes they're not. Um, so part of my efforts in writing the book were to create an homage to them. Um, the first poem that I'm going to read, however, is not from Breakpoint. Um, it is um, one I wrote for my mother, who is uh, a medical doctor when women were not actually commonly going to medical school and um, the poem is a bit about that it's also about um, the kind of mortification that only young children can experience early in life when their parents embarrass them but then they realize there's lessons to be learned about that later it's called autobiography your mother your mother is screaming at someone else not you your mother is screaming at a stranger, some guy with a red tie and a limp mustache, some guy who hasn't eaten enough protein, looks like his hair is falling out, too greasy, no sleep. She's screaming out the window of the big blue valiant. She's screaming words you remember for the rest of your life you remember. She's screaming at the string bean parking lot attendant to Leonard Morse Hospital. She's pulling her face up closer to his face. He's edging back into the yellow, the asphalt reserved for hospital staff, for the medics with staff privileges. And she's driving forward in a roar, and she's screaming for the four women in the Yale class of 1965. She's screaming for all the men who said she shouldn't be here on this spot, grinding the steering wheel she's screaming so her daughters will remember. You thought because I was a woman, I couldn't be a doctor. So that's my mom. Um, you can see that it kind of tees um, someone up for a career in STEM to have a kind of pioneering mom who who um, 
went forward even though it wasn't common for uh, women to be doctors at that time um but then there's also you know my dad's side of the family which is japanese american and uh, the next poem i'm going to read is called is from breakpoint it's called walking here is to be swallowed by the sky um it's for the topaz museum opening july 2017 and i think it, it, it harkens to the other side of my family um my dad who is also a doctor and this is his side of the family walking here is to to be swallowed by the sky one bits of wood and wallboard outline a family in the dirt it is important not to become bitter grandpa said as his eyes looked away to a time where the ground turned to terrible soup when it rained snow falling through slats then he died his sons went back to see what became of youth spent with barbed wire and dog's teeth a man shot for walking too close to the wires now the wind has nothing to be outside of the desert has nothing to stop it it can't happen here again you say no more huddled bodies no more small boys throwing rocks at the fence two if you can only think of twin towers falling remember topaz internment camp opened on september 11th 1942 its mouth wide as the desert sky open hate shoving suitcases spilled onto the sidewalk slurs tracked into the fields like fertilizer splash of green on slate rocks and white dust epithets scattered everywhere like bits of trash no one bothered with coat hangers broken cold cream jars kids marbles when they left piles of nails crunch underfoot weeds tumble between buildings no longer there a testament to what people believed could change millions of years ago this desert was a sea and at night with nothing to do but fear my grandmother made seashells into necklaces they keep trying to tell you looping i once was wet grew fish with iridescent scales now stark memories are powdered bone in a cage on a string whirls break the hinges let all these silent birds fly home to roost So my dad was actually in that internment camp. So that is my my tribute to him. Um, the next few poems I'm uh, intending to read are really about the computational language um, that I tried to play with in Breakpoint. There are actually um, essentially code poems written in Python that exist and kind of seeded throughout the book. Um, but this is this is talking about language. Um, and computer programming language kind of together, poetic language and the computational language. Encapsulation and computer programming. P plants close off portions of themselves to bear their seeds. Think on the milkweed pod bursting its fuzzy halos over a field to the fringes of encapsulation. I've sealed myself into medicines that I've taken. Poisons carefully applied, sealed in their gelatin gelatin shells and worn down by the life of the intestine to burst a dose, a remedy, a bomb. A bomb can encapsulate the fate of a woman. Someday SpaceX might present me as its aviatrix to Mars, and I'll toss on the heap of memory everything that I couldn't keep, that I couldn't hide, inside shadows of class structure, nor perfect, nor perfect with noose and cowl and space shoot, space suit, sorry, any of my illusions of running slowly through time. Okay, um, the next one is about, um, a lot of com computer programming is around uh, conserving or figuring out how you use your, the memory of the computer and the machine. Um, so that's what this poem tries to touch on. The decimal is a heartbeat, it can stop itself or repeat. The first thing to know about this language is how it laces up memory, cinches memory up in a bale, hay, hay golden across an umber field. You know how much you can carry in your hands. The first one's a string, a cat's cradle crisscrossing all the lines on your palm. You know how much you can carry in your purse. The second one's an integer crammed with usefulness and shine, too much nail polish on these numbers. When you cry, they won't break. You know how much memory you packed into the back of a Honda Civic fleeing the next broken bone, 
Jealous Rage, Crashing Bottle. Remember how Infinity went? Lines of the highway hugging the land like a sister. That last one's the float. Up to and including the rounding. Of the sun that set over the shitty motel you hit at and sped to some town that smelled of batter and burning tires. Integers like miles pouring into the horizon. Um, let's see, I'm gonna just double check my time. Um, how much time do I have left? You're good, you have like 10 minutes left. Okay, okay, good, all right. I'll keep going then. Um, this next one is um, about working in the game industry and um, uh, finding the language all around you is, um, well, it's pretty interesting, uh, especially when you feel like you have a medical problem that you might need to tell your boss about. In this case, uh, you know, crisis averted, nothing bad happened, um, but it was interesting to think about how, how that language, the set of languages might collide there. It's called Standing in the Xbox Building Parking Lot. Blurred within Ninja Video, slicing an arm to bone seems so easy. A guy walks by her with a cigarette cloud for a head. Virtual splashes of blue X's and yellow skulls, leading to his oily motorcycle, red leather flames licking his black pants. She is standing in the building's parking lot, wondering if she has breast cancer, and if so, how to tell him, the boss. So surreal to be on the cell miles away from the 20 TVs stacked in her cubicle, talking to a nurse about the lump that ticks like a grenade in gears of war under her armpit. Don't blink, whispers the world. She taps, put on extra lipstick, listening in girl camo and corporate face as the nurse drones. Don't wear deodorant before the extra mammogram. Has she made space for invader after invader under the casual chill of decades? There must be a better word for Godspeed and God mode and the crash that changes your life for good. After hearing the terror, she will go back to the war, targeting deep inside the steel and glass where walls of people code and collide, where there is no such thing as a perfect shadow perfect water, or perfect tears, just perfect breasts. And then um, I actually did a, a kind of series. I, I read Gertrude Stein's Tender Buttons back uh, back and forward and studied the sentence structure and all that stuff. Um, and I ended up um, with um, a kind of broken apart piece called uh, Tender Buttons of the Computer Age. Um, of which a few I'm going to read um, at this reading. Not clicky, not piston, not Python, not pebbles we picked up on the beach, not the talk on my phone, not the mute, not print screen, made of wool, cotton, leather, silk, made of skin, nerve, muscle stretched thin, flushed with blood, all you can look at when my face is up here. What language, what version? A computer is full of parrot and pieces of eight. What pirates sail these seas, unblinking, scurvy need, and sure of the tongue their mother spoke. There was always an earlier version that was better with better coordinates of reference. There was always the future to look forward to. Let me just see if I can. And then the break point. A hop drops like a stone to the rabbit, caught at a stop like the program. Like the ship locks, letting water out to sea where we stop and I'll check our backpacks, making sure we have enough water. It's a long climb up before we can run. Um, just a couple more here, because I think we're running out of time. But um, and I do want to give you the Jericho Brown one, so. Um, let's do it. Automata factory. The only way you can get sick here is if you bring it with you. Messy fluids smeared in fingerprints across the white diamond glass. Breathe, breathe horse steam against vibrating steel grates. Cop your flu unheard against the engines of the night. The workers wear white masks and helmets. Exoskeletons carve their sinews into wind-up toys with silver capillaries. Voids Voices flit from radio to radio, barking orders less human-looking than their handiwork. This is the assembly line where they press down faces for market. 
They start out cerise, tout, green, and end up bronze, ebony, ivory, pink. The faces they give you repel disease, attract wealth, give off pheromones that will linger in hallways. But you will only speak the language of faces once you put them on. The ears are part of the deal and only buzz in a certain range. The poor are gone and you cannot smell them. Only a humming like a refrigerator constant in the background might make its way to your jaw. Sometimes the face will clench and grind your prosthetic teeth in the night. You won't know it except in your bones. No one would know anything to look at you. And then... I think what I'd like to do is close with Slouching Like a Velvet Rope. Um, that's the one that was selected for the Auburn Witness Poetry Prize. Um, it's really dedicated to if you've ever been in a meeting or in a place where you're the only one of your kind, uh, which could be, um, in this case, it's about gender, but it could be along many axes of marginalization. So here we go. And this will be my last poem. Slouching Like a Velvet Rope. Yesterday, my name was power, adapter, toaster, jockey, tag spinner. Today, it's anger and liquid mercury evading reach. Tomorrow, I'll be breaking the rules by showing up. Elbows on the table, scared to my sneakers of getting fired. Being the girl who leans forward into everyone's face instead of ornamental. If you show me your newest phone, I might brain you with mine. Dig out your skull and put a chip in instead. All a gadget wants is to be turned on and stroked. Lips against its glass surface, it reflects someone else's face. A gadget is not a woman. No one will notice that it isn't you in there. Just like no one noticed that my name isn't that girl and I didn't come here from marketing. I flew in full frontal from engineering. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you so much. And now we'll hear from Rebecca. So poet, botanist, and artist Rebecca A. Durham is the author of two award-winning poetry books, Half-Life of Empathy and Loss Less. Originally from New England, she now lives in Montana where she works as a botanist. She holds a BA in biology from Colby College, an MS in botany from Oregon State University, and an MFA in creative writing in poetry from the University of Montana. Um, she earned her PhD in interdisciplinary studies from the University of Montana, and where she examined the intersection between poetry and science. Find more of her work at RebeccaDurham.net. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Thanks so much, Danielle. And thanks, Betsy, um, for reading with me. And thanks to uh, everyone uh, listening uh, now and in the future. Um, I am going to read um, a few poems um, from my first book, Half-Life of Empathy, and then um, a few poems from Lossless. Um, and I'm just kind of going to plow through the the reading part, but um, we'll, we'll uh, be time to, to chat more about uh, kind of uh, the, the synergy between STEM and, and poetry uh, in a bit. Um, biological assessment. I make gestures of thriving, start with what I know, kneeling. Cells spun in long hollow strands, held together this dance into form. Beside it, more lichen, blue-green algae in there, breathing light. I make gestures of belonging. I know between fallen leaves, there's more lichen and moss and turkey tail mushrooms. I know their action will harm sensitive, threatened, or endangered lichens and or their habitat. Kneel here to memory, gray-green, soon slain. Red stem fillery. Into November's brown yawn, your perfect crimson intrusion keeps flinging. Your pink rosettes erode emptiness. Erodium from the Greek erodios heron. Stork's bill, crane's bill, red stem fillery. The shroud of your red ruse, of color, of naming what is here without. 
What does the sky call you? The sky calls me nothing. <clears throat> Viscous slick. Like an eternal surge of epinephrine, it quickens, inters reverberations. An electron cloud royals is the aggregate of asphalt, buries lacunae, porous dirt, clods of moss. Our chloroplast spindle, periodic table unravels. DNA splits, is darned into kinetic impotence. Base pairs cleave. Tell me, what is the half-life of empathy? Dark frolic, tar teeth, our lurch of dust. On crustose lichens. Nose to ground, knees near nose, belly folding over. Stoop to see life, lichens. Two unlike things meld, become one. All colors, all kinds, like an endless soil skin. What if you look close, closer? Bumpy white body flecked with black sex sacs. Those are the apothecia. Slice a little under the scope to see the spores. Crustos, folios, suppose you knew their language. Suppose you always see the sky. I'm gonna move on to uh, some poems from Lossless. Citizen of you, Penstemon. When I close my eyes, I see Penstemon blue violet, see Colleen leaves, minutely hertelis perburulent. Dusk sticks to the Penstemon to be buried just as part of the pollen record. All these genocided genomes smothered in blue violet, globose glands, glabrous ovary, glaucous leaves. O oh, flagging earth, palette of disappearing species, your worshiper kneels in sight today. My last flag waves Corolla's blue violet, rising from a codex, rising from a codex, this nation of one. Inconsistent stasis. One, luminous with illusion and elation begins, lures us to the distillate with unrivaled devotion. Fragmentation as absorption, we echolocate to orient the finite, engage in this act of finding blue and translucent. Two, unnatural aberration, they forget the smell of sedges, heady black muck, organic saturation, Water licks the green shards, licks brown columns. When time is repealed, florets will flow unfettered. Three, sometimes roots never loosen. Sometimes a butterfly is a fulcrum. See this dark smudge or surge of urgency. We never saw it coming, stood at the edge of shatter, should have seen it coming, crooked and bedraggled. Four, at the fringes rides the derivation of violet, this silver violence forged from forget. Five, what makes us buoyant, not the squeeze of evening, nor the innumerable compendium of an indigo aperture. Six, stasis spurs equilibrium, reciprocal integration. We hug our small realities, retire to the flower fields. Seven, it was a false summit we surmised, the broken basalt and alloy of the absolute. Take these cottonwood bones or the miracle of cotyledons, the struggle of reeds and ferns, this cessation of friction. Eight, we hear a summons among leaves, cytokines and lipid layers, a tangle of molecules, lurch of detritus. Take these aggregations of atoms, folded and misfolded. Differentiation always explicit. What they feel and how they speak. Oblique helix. I have become impermeable, gated by ligands, conductive to sound only, 
Somewhere in the continuum, I sense God, not your God, not the one of religion or matter or anything except irradiated energy. Flood the calcium potassium channels. I am responsive to current, responsive. Voltage varies, opens or shuts the gate. Unleash the cellular lasso, invert this. Open this amplitude. I slip through the gating ring. I'm the eye. Sense excitatory subunits. I'm hyperpolarized. I spark the gates. The sky writhes in me. Pull away lungs to feel, fill my heart with blood. Between systole, diastole is the flare of me. Such a lush threshold flesh. Viscosity. The surface beckons, reflections illuminate one strand of sky we covet as blue. I, you see it, we are riveted, riven. Synapses track and recreate geometry, physics, the electron royal, matter, even pulsing, the pause of approximation between expectation and motion. We watch it cease to be a self. We cease to be anything but sky dust. Now lucid color, time folds through itself to drink this ice age residual, to touch this mercurial mirage. We are oscillating cinders slick with life. Atoms helix light, quiver like silver. We sane waves, parse sky slivers. Now nothing retains the taint of a part, neither matter nor water. <clears throat> the next one I'm going to read is um, is in parts um, like as if it was a journal article with the abstract introduction, um, like a scientific um, paper. Human impacts on the Earth systems in the Anthropocene, a human other narrative. Abstract. Someone says stop being and here we kneel. Introduction. First, we gave each other our gazes. The fawn without moving wasn't there. I averted, became wide birth, was anti-disturbance. She, we, unwary, aware. Lichens leak from fingers, vision, crush color. We're epiphytes, we're unable to resist being. When I come to rest, larches become we. These forests aren't productive. We're unproductive with them. We are radical and bentness. We are overstocked thicket mistletoe topiary. We are thrushes singing, swallowtails unfurl, and I follow. We walk wide berths, skirt pre-emergent herbicide. They say instant re-entry, say non-toxic, but it smells says something else, says wide berth, says someone will soon stop being there. I gather my being here, aren't productive, become an aversion to green growing, brown dread as we wait machines to fix the forest, fix productivity. Thrush babies unaware, wary, we're blind still, no wide birth. We want to say stop. Thrush sings, stop beings, and together we're watching. Materials and methods. Coyote first wild of the day, not even out of the truck, ochre flash of tail loping away. Down the sharp slope toward the light green on the aerial can only mean wetland. I seek the aberrations, survey the anomalies. Down the old skid trail over slash and sticks, steep enough to slip on moss, and I fall before finding a couple stout sticks to temper my descent. Toward the draw, and I'm drawn like the Swainson's thrush, who I hear down there spiraling song through thicket. Past the second growth firs and choke of nine bark, until I hear water and see nothing but a swath of close green. Western birch and Rocky Mountain maple and mock orange block the flow, but I hear it even over the thrushes who surround me now, invisible in the deep green branches. Through the currents and rows and hawthorn, until I am in it, the wet seep of cool mud cresting my boots and the monkey flower poised over the slow creek like pursed yellow lips. Too slow to drink, water widens here, into a fragrant spread of muck and life and pools and seeps. I find grape fern, a squeal worthy new addition to our plant list, run my fingers over the sporophyte. This marks the depth of richness, this dark black soil so full it lured, lured this fern ally. 
I follow the water to the boundary where it fans out into a spring fed spread where insects flock. To understand that water is life is to squat here in the hum and flutter. I watch the wing dance until the heat bakes my back and head to the animal path near the water that winds in the near close canopy. Upstream, returning now and then to crawl through the dense shrubs to not miss anything. Thorns scrape my skin and sticks lodge in my hair and I claw and wade through what the water brings. Back on the path, I startle a snake who disappears under an alder bowl. Almost where the water is underground, I stop among the chickadees. Dee, 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 they scold, curious, then fly close. I talk back, make my best impression of the burrs and dees. And one of them approves of me and maybe thinks of taking a chance, starts the Phoebe call, which I always think of as love me. And I do love back that they maybe they are saying, get the hell out of here. Or maybe just who are you? A scarlet tanager also comes to cluck and scold cardinal red head and warbler yellow body blazing from the dull brown branches. I call to them and call to them and they surround me for 10 minutes or so until the heat feels acute and I'm out of water. So I walk up slope until all signs of water are gone and the heat captures all sound except the insect swell of chitin and wings. This is how I enter the forest and this is how it enters me too in increments following the water of our bodies until we become our own wet ecology integrated and held. Results. Katie did. Katie did. Katie did. Katie. Katie. Katie did. Katie didn't. Katie. 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 Katie did. Katie did. Katie did. Katie did. Katie. Katie. Katie did. Katie did. Discussion. Dark lily sobs for extant or extinct. Our garden mirrors a swarm of sunset littered with two diethyl hydroxymethyl benzene. Or is it 2 diethyl hydroxymethyl phosphonate? No, I mean toxin. Tell me what is the isomer of grief? Because pebbled with intention, I inspect the tender wonders. I stop water falling in ohm with spreading fingers. Droplets fling and cave over air like epithelial cells. Met metastasis should be a good word, as in megastasis, equilibrium, but scars make a certain kind of kindling. Memory bears the fruit of shadow and bright haunt makes a fever of it. With geometric pressure becomes the solemn molecule. This is how it breaks. Methane spews over amber waves or in amber waves. America, 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 what did you do to apoptosis? What was placid is elastic or plastic or caustic. Cuts light into parcels and delivers them by drone holds a ladder to an iris to watch the gaze of night blur because faint delicate breath and because mysterious symbiosis, the history of extraction became prophecy. Carcinogenic snow spills a hydrocarbon creation story. This is how we break. I call a moratorium on cement or at least errant elements. I can taste the vacancy of extinction. I am asking what is our ecstasy and acquisition? This is an inquisition into our monstrous lust. The river was sheer-eyed and eloquent in its entirety. I knelt there with blue praise and bruised pines. I knelt there, making a fever of it. Conclusion. Acorn, the good news is greenness. I think, I think that's, I'm um, good with time, right, Danielle? Yeah, you have about six minutes left. Okay, cool. I'll read, read another one here. Okay. This water is licked by lambs. If light is a mere imposter, then water brims buoyant, is a solvent of twilight. Some water waits submerged, but this water is aerated and underrated, is almost as good as it used to be. Recently, this water was a clotted cloud. This water has a killer attitude, falls with altitude. This water tears through reluctant sediment, saunters across the tarmac and pulses like I am's. This water frolics with hemlocks, ferries fern spores from forests, reflects phosphorescence and inflorescence. This water is a ceaseless torrent. This water is a tur turbulent ebullience and an insurmountable mountain. 
This water is tainted with tar, is bent with effluent. This water carries carcinogens. This water warns us from an oblique cue. This water asks us to query excess. This water chokes on our viscous silence. Um, I'll just read a, um, the last poem in, in Lossless is a, is a long poem sort of in parts and um, I'll just read a, a one portion of it and then I'll end with that. Lurch shadows engulf us. We tuck tight into deciduousness. Early earnest kissed, fistful of falling lichen. Did we gather wood, gather other ether? How we came to know ourselves in relation to the turning. A long orange band of sound, eruptive and imperceptible, save with mycelium ears. Juncos are wintering here. Crepuscular fenestrations, climate rage, disarray, habitability, instability, a shrinking, insistent, accelerant, a carbon bargain. Take this little dot and squeeze. Take the platelets and empty cells, bioaccumulation of toxic smog, burnt anthropogenic VOCs. The needles know your name. Needles know our reference condition. And I'll end there. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both. Um, I'm going to just take the spotlight off. Rebecca, and we should see the questions. So what I'd like to do now is really to have uh, a conversation and also to get your thoughts on some things. So again, thank you so much for sharing your work. One of the reasons that I wanted to start this series was in part from reflecting on the intersection between information retrieval and poetry um, in my own work. As a librarian, I need to be able to quickly and efficiently retrieve information um, that's you know, within my area of expertise and way beyond my area of expertise. And I don't think that I would be as effective at doing this, at composing search strings, at selecting the right words and putting them in the right order, um, if I hadn't studied poetry. Um, so along those lines, I have a few questions to pose to each of you, and you can feel free to answer all of these or just one of them, um, but just some stuff to get the conversation going. So first, how does reading or writing poetry impact your work in STEM fields? And or how do you think about STEM related topics? Or excuse me, how, how you think about STEM related topics? Um, how does or how has your work in STEM fields impacted how you read or write poetry? And what do you think that poetry in general and as a medium brings to the exploration of STEM topics? So I know that's a lot, but um, what are your thoughts on these things? Do you want me to go or? Sure. For me, um, uh, I, you know, I got my MFA right before I started doing um, work on the web, and this was in the early days of the web, so there weren't a ton of classes, in fact there were none, and a, a lot of people were self-taught. So poetry and technology have kind of grown hand in hand for me because I, you know, left the MFA thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to do a book or whatever, and then also like, oh, I'm going to change the world with the web, blah, 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 and, um, but I really didn't write about technology until um, I had uh, gone to the Palm Beach Poetry Festival, which I think is on hiatus right now, but um, my instructor there was uh, Kimiko Han, and I had that an early version of that Xbox parking lot poem uh, because it was sort of the first time I'd even tried to write about my day job. And um, uh, Kimiko urged me to, to write further, and Kimiko at that time had just started doing a lot of the science poems that um, she had talked to me about like looking at sort of the Daily New York Times science um, articles and things and having ideas out of that. And so I feel like that was kind of the beginning of the STEM writing part because before that I was writing in I think pretty classical MFA topics, right? Like, and 
you know, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, and nature's a big thing here. Theodore Rutke, David Wagner, all the great outdoors and stuff. And so, like, it wasn't a huge leap to write about the outdoors, and I had written, you know, poems about nature. But to actually write about technology and, you know, the essentially this STEM area that I was teaching myself was actually... I needed, weirdly, I needed outside permission for that. And so once I actually had that outline, that per- permission, um, I took the project of trying to write about women in technology to Hedgebrook, which is a fabulous residency if, if you can apply for it and get the time. Um, you spend time in the cabin in the woods, but it was the first time in my technology career I had any kind of focused time to write a kind of focused body of work as opposed to like a poem here and there. Um, and that's where I think the idea about your day job actually matters inside the literary realm, like they're not separate, it first came to me. Um, I think because people were not writing about technology at that time. And even now I feel like the technological topics are not quite as, you know, in the forefront as, as possibly, you know, the vanishing ecosystem or um, of, of, of the outdoors and, the, you know, nature. I don't know. Did you have permission given to you or did you just leap in? Unlike me, who was like, oh, really? I could write about that? Oh. Yeah, I guess uh, I never, you know, people people often like remark like, oh, you just, you know, you, you're not afraid to just like, you know, put in put in all that, uh, you know, all the botany language or all the science language. And, and it just never occurred to me that they would, even, you know, because they all coexist in my mind. Right. So like my personal archive is the things that I'm thinking about and the things that I know about. And, and that's the language that's, um, you know, already are, you know, in, in sort of my brain. So that's, yeah, I, I didn't, I guess I didn't feel like I, um, needed permission, but, um, you know, it, it definitely, um, it, it, I can see, you know, there is kind of that pressure, especially in a, uh, in, in a, in an MFA program sometimes or, or, you know, in what's published to kind of write a certain way or certain topics. And, um, and sometimes I guess it can be seen as non-accessible when you're just, you know, using kind of the, the jargon that's in your field. Right. But, um, I don't think that's a reason to, or at least I've ne- <laughs> it's never occurred to me to be a reason to not kind of go there. Um, but, uh, did you want to? Yeah, I was just going to say, I thought that was interesting about the idea of like having permission, like there are topics that you can write about and then topics that you can't write about. And it reminds me of a discussion that I recently had with a student. They brought back our print newspaper and I was asked if I would like to contribute a poem to it. And we were talking about, you know, like not all poems have to rhyme. Not all poems have to be about love and the big things in life. They could be about the really small, simple, everyday things. Um, they can be about what you're doing and still be really meaningful and impactful. Um, so just the the point about like sometimes we wait for permission to write about certain things um, just really struck me and resonated with me. Well, and I think, I mean, except uh, there's a, online publication that I think unfortunately is no longer in existence I think it was called the carbon culture journal but like that was literally the only place that specifically was about technology related writing for that I mean I placed a couple of poems from the book there um and the rest were just randomly picked up like Automata Factory was picked up for a prize by the Nassau Review um because they had a technology theme for that particular contest right so it 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 always felt like the other, at least up until that point, the the poems that I wrote on other topics and not technology had an easier, understandable time. Um, and then, I mean, some of the poems that I didn't read out of break point are like video game observations, right? And I'm not sure of the nexus of the folks that play video games and read poetry at the same time, but do you know what I mean? Like you're you're looking for ways that you can bring modern life into um into your work and um I, like i said i just haven't seen a lot of that that kind of writing um the speculative um journals do have some of it but then of course you're talking about speculative technology and science fictiony kinds of topics so 
Um, it still feels like we, we have some ways to go before people relax into the idea that they can write about their technology as easily as other stuff. Totally. Yeah, I, I, oh, uh, you're going to go, oh, Rebecca? No, go like, uh, no, I actually I have both of your books in front of me right now. Um, so one thing I was wondering is a question for you, Betsy. Um, you know, thinking about, okay, we have permission to use technology, write about technology. What do you think something like um, writing out code as a piece of poetry? Can you walk me through the process of, you know, like something like um, 120 many to many collisions? Like, oh, sure. So like, that's kind of cheating in that um, I took this class um, because I kind of wanted to keep my brain thinking about these kind of problems. Um, because I, I work with engineers, programmers all the time. And so like they have work, you know, they they write code, they test their own code, they check in their code, the code is built into the in, in, in the current case into the into a game build, right? And then you you play test and you try to play the game. Um, so I took this class on Coursera called Introduction to I wanna say it was interactive programming or game programming in Python, and essentially Right, it was a uh, Rice University professors had uh, ran it. Um, you had to write a game in Python every week, and you know because I only had like essentially weekends to do this. There was a lot of cursing and coffee and a, a lot of late nights kind of spent on it. Um, but I felt like afterwards, um, certain chunks of it, largely what I'm sure computer science students will, like recognize readily as functions, right? Um, they felt like units of if not exactly story, like vignettes of existence, right? And so I felt like somewhere in this book, I had to have the machine language. And I mean, we're not going to do assembly language and we're not going to do bits and bytes and stuff like something that, that kind of bridge the, you know, the way humans talk to machines and um, the machine's own language. And so that's why I included the little bits of code poems, which you can't really read out. Um, I mean, it would be highly boring for all of you because I'd be reading the symbols, but like, uh, I did feel like um, there's an elegance and conciseness to the programming, and there's also verbs and nouns. And you know, you don't have to know Python, hopefully, to look at the code poems and think about what is being described there, and you know, what pictures am I making in your mind, right? Mm -hmm. oh, great, that's great. Thank you. And. Um... Also, Rebecca, about using like uh, a journal article as a type of format for poetry. Can you walk me through thinking through something like that? Yeah, um, I, yeah. I, I I try to play with form a bit, and um, you know that that poem in particular, um, it, it's actually sort of a. I mean, there's there's a lot of pieces of it, but um, it, it really kind of came from. I I do a lot of field work and. Um, and so I, I'm out in the woods by myself and, um, y you know, I, I I just really like it. Um, you know, a lot of my work really, really stems from eco melancholia, you know, kind of um, sadness about destruction of the the more than human world. And um, and so and I, I do, you know, read a lot of journal articles and and I'm exposed to, you know, kind of that format. So I, I, I was just kind of thinking like, you know, what if I, you know, thought about this topic of like forestry and forest productivity and in in the space where science is usually um, performed in this form, um, but as a poetic uh, form. And, um, you know, that's that's one thing that I um, really, really like about poetry um, and thinking about science topics. I I. I kind of I termed it um, feel space is kind of just a little little um, word I put on to, to to that space we hold for um, kind of like how we process um, you know scientific topics and and the things that are happening around us in emotional space and a and a space that is is not doesn't have like the constraints right so science is is very um, you know, there are a lot of obviously uh, um, commonalities between art making and science, creativity, you know, uh, both science and create and uh, um, poetry take um, take a lot of creativity. Um, but 
science is, you know, it, it's it's very focused. So, you know, you might have a journal article that's looking at the, um, you know, forest productivity, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't talk about, you know, the, the you know, the animals that might be there if you go in and thin the forest. It just might be like the pre-commercial thin, you know, so it's very focused. And and I find that, um, you know, not only do I appreciate, but I, 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 I long to sort of take that information that I'm, sort of have to work in the constraints of science and give it the space to, you know, think about um, what are the what are the emotional ramifications of this topic? What are, you know, what's what's the history? What's the the future? What's, you know, how does it what are the social impacts? So, you know, science can just be very focused and specific, which is OK for what it is. But I think it's it's in, it's just one way of knowing. And we have to um, expand um, it into um, art to kind of get a, a fuller, broader picture of whatever that information is um, so we can incorporate, um, you know, some other um, aspects of that information instead of just um, what it that's specifically focusing, focusing in. So. so it's like a broader context. Like exactly. The science that everybody knows and, and the box of, checked off the journal article of science, but then there's everything else tied into that topic. Exactly. Yeah. It's much broader. I it's much it's much um you know you're able to bring in like you know socioeconomic, you know, all, all these like different things um and like I, have you ever read um uh like like or heard like Timothy Morton's term the hyper hyper objects the um kind of the how we have all these problems now um, that are just they're so broad that you you can't kind of even wrap your head around them like tox toxic problems and climate change and like all these like things that expend you know extend into many directions both um, you know spatially and temporally and um, incorporate all kinds of things and it's it's um, it's just to try to like poke it all into one graph or something is just it's a little bit uh, lacking in some in some ways. Um, it's more holistic to to put it into poetry or or other forms of art. I think. Yeah, in a way, um, I was thinking as you were were talking. So I kind of feel like I'm studying right now in the field of education, and you know, there's the whole qualitative and quantitative mix in, you know, going into the dissertation program. And I think a lot sometimes that poetry that focuses on technology, it's almost like it's bringing sort of a qualitative edge to something we often think is very quantitative. And it allows you to really zoom in on particular areas that uh, things like numbers can't cover. So the human aspect, you know, other aspects. Um, so that's um, that's a really great discussion. Would you like to add anything before we move on to the audience uh, challenge? I was going to just say that, I mean, the, the thing about working on a video game, though, is that, like, it's not pure lines of code, right? Like, mm -hmm. you're trying to make a kind of next-gen or modern artistic work in conjunction with you know many other people because it takes that that many other people to do it so it's not just um you know what i mean it's not just sort of like dry technology or dry science that comes out of the merging of the you know the artistic creative side and the technical or the scientific side i think you can come up with sort of new creation forms mm -hmm. and in my case it happens to be a video game but like do you know what i mean like there are other things that can come out of the union of stem thinking and classical fine arts thinking, right? Absolutely. Okay, just want to make sure that the slides are moving forward. Um, so one thing that um, I asked you to think about coming into this reading was one thing that you would like attendees to take time to consider with regard to the intersection or the synergy between STEM and reading or writing poetry. And also, if you'd like to, um, pose maybe a prompt for those who are watching uh, the session on record. So I'll let you take it away. Uh, I have a I have a prompt. Um, 
So one thing, one thing that I've done that's um, it, sometimes when I go and uh, I have a specific topic of mine, and then I'll research that um, that topic and, and kind of get into some of the the more nitty gritty details of um, the scientific topic that I'm interested in writing about. Um, and uh, but another thing to do is if you just start with whatever you're interested in. So say you know, say, say your your field is, you know, molecular biology, and then you go and find a journal article, you know, a peer-reviewed journal article that um, is interesting to you, and make an erasure poem of it. So take the journal article, and then just start highlighting, um, you know, words or phraselets that are interesting to you, and then um, kind of uh, at the end of that, just rearrange those and make that into um, a poem. So it's kind of like a floral legium erasure poem that um, you can make from the um, a journal article. That's great. I think I'm going to make that a program for the library. <laughs> <laughs> we can definitely do that. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's so much discussion now about like, chat GBT and what can you know the AI write that the humans can't and I actually wrote like a science fiction story um, uh, that's in Uncanny Magazine uh, online about the question of you know what you really need humans for in terms of art and um, I, I mean I definitely think I, I could go on that's a whole nother like presentation I think or a whole nother discussion panel but um, the prompt that I thought about was, um, you know, the chat GPT and these other programs are taking in large linguistic data sets and understanding how uh, language is being put together and, um, and, and how people talk, at least in print, and then they come back with responses to their prompts, right? And so I thought maybe folks might try the challenge of writing a poem about a machine translation gone wrong and then in a sequel reply poem, tackle the same topic of the translation gone right. And who is satisfied more of the translation, the machine or the human speaker? And who is the, the third, the listener in the conversation? And how do you portray their listening? So um, I, I feel like there's just a lot to be explored around, you know, what little or much the human humans understand or and or machines do not um and then how they might well talk past each other thinking they understand each other when we're just using the same words um you know it's unclear whether whether the ai actually is understanding what you're actually saying or not right so um that would be my prompt i guess just something to think that's great. Um, there's so much discussion right now, especially in libraries, um, about um, AI software that can produce text and what it's going to mean for student papers and student work. And I think that's that's a really um, interesting prompt, taking that into consideration. Um, I'm definitely going to pose that to our students too. We'll definitely we'll have we're definitely going to have a poetry day <laughs> for them, and that's going to definitely be part of that. That is awesome. Um, we do have time. We, I see we do have a guest. If there are any questions, please do feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, we will be watching. Um, any other thoughts about anything that we've discussed today um, before we, we close out for the evening? I really love the prompts. I really do. They're really great. Um, one one thing that I came across um, in my investigations of of this topic was that um, when that you know a lot of people like to talk about the brain and and um, but but when you when you're learning information like science information you're just taking in information and when you're having an emotional response they're kind of to two different areas. And so if you're taking in information, science information, and you're having an emotional response because it's in art, like poetry, and you're you're kind of having a feel feel space response, um, then it's more likely, can be more likely to actually retain that information 
because when you're making uh, having emotions, um, your brain gets activated and you're more likely to remember that. So I think it can be a really um, big tool in um, in science education that could be employed more as a you know as an additional way to take in that information instead of just um, as information. So just wanted to, I thought that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. One of the things that um, I was looking at when I proposed this program and was doing some background research was looking at how poetry was used in science courses. And although they're small scale studies, um, there were uh, classes that used it to learn physics. They had to pick a concept, write a poem. There were uh, college level anatomy and physiology courses. One article talked about um, the groups having to pick a particular area of the body and they had to write a limerick on it. And students who were in the limerick group happened to uh, remember much more than the uh, folks in the non-poetry uh, A and P groups. So um, it is it is a very powerful learning tool for sure. Because um, as you said, if you're forced to research something in order to write about it, I mean the retention, you know, is is uh, you know that part is there. Yeah. Well, and I think too, like for computer programmers and folks that have to use very precise logical language in their STEM field, like I think weirdly the economy of poetry is is not going to be foreign to them, right? Like they might have more fun with it possibly, but like in terms of being able to play with the language and break rules and stuff like that. But um, I, I think it's 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 not that big a jump. Just like um, a, a lot of the programmers I've met in my career are like also play music for some reason. So I feel like there's definitely ways that um, uh, different kinds of creative communication or, you know, conciseness comes into play. And poetry is is usually nothing if not that, um, the compression of emotional ex and other kinds of experience down. So I think STEM students might might not feel like it, but they might have an actually an edge in, in creating this kind of thing. Um, it's all part of the same brain system. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, thank you so, so much for sharing your work and having this discussion this evening. Um, thank you again, Betsy and Rebecca for joining us. And I just wanna remind the folks who are watching um, right now, I'm gonna pop in the chat the link to our reminder form, you can fill this out and you'll get an update on the next reading and when the recording is available. And uh, I am going to stop the recording now and I just want to thank everybody uh, for attending this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much.